Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast presented by HypeBot.com. Thank you to our big sponsors, HypeBot. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and as always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. How you doing today, Jay? I'm doing great. We got new music coming out from Cheap Trick. Oh, God, I'm uh, so we excited. We got new music new coming Cheap out Trick from album. Sticks. <laughs> yes. It's that's, just a good day. That's exciting. Uh, Cheap, Cheap Trick uh, received the... Um, Chairman's Award for for a, uh, sustained creative achievement at Music Biz 2016. So it was there. That's just the, uh, uh, the it's the perfect example of someone being completely appropriately honored because they're that's sustaining right. their creative achievements. Walk in the walk. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you uh, kind of helped me out there. Uh, we have a guest today. We've got James Donio uh, from Music Biz Association. Um, you may remember Music Biz Association used to be NARM. Um, I can, ja- if, James I slide, if I slide to go. the side a little bit, can I do that? There, there you go. go. There yes. you go. <laughs> and that's, uh, a, that's a plaque that um, was given to me on my 25th anniversary with the association, so it's was given to me by by Universal. So it's the twenty five top twenty five top albums for each of the years that I've was uh, at at Narm now Music Biz from nineteen eighty eight. Awesome. Congratulations, man. That's super cool. And and I have that holds a place in my heart because I was with Universal for 18 years and uh, I still uh, adore those people over there. I did want to mention that um, we will see you in Nashville uh, May 15th through the 18th for this year's uh, yes. Music Business Association. So, James, welcome to our show. Thank you. Great to be here. Excellent. So tell those who don't know what Music Business Association is and, and your role there, uh, tell them a little bit about it. So as we just um, made reference to, so it's been the Music Business Association uh, going on now four years, but for the 50, uh, 55 years prior to that, it was NARM, National Association of Recording Merchandisers. Uh, the organization was created in the late 1950s around the relationships between um, wholesales, wholesalers and distributors. Um, and actually at that point in time, uh, there were no specialty you know, music stores. Music was sold in uh, health and beauty stores and in uh, department stores and discount stores. So of course now here we find ourselves in 2017 uh, in a marketplace where sales has you know now dropped to not be the majority of music consumption but the music that is sold is still being sold in all kinds of of retail establishments including health and beauty stores and discount stores and department stores so uh, i guess everything old becomes new again some things don't change even though the way that people are um, discovering and accessing and consuming music uh, you know, has you know reached a, a, a new sort of paradigm in 2017. Yeah, I've been going to NARM slash Music Biz. This will be my 15th year, and I would love for you to kind of touch on, I mean, the changes the evolution. and the evolution exactly because I know I've seen it and I know you've seen it, and it's so exciting for me to not see a part of the music industry become marginalized a dinosaur irrelevant what you've done is you've seen what's happening in the market and you've kind of shifted what this whole convention and what the association is about can you kind of touch on the evolution and what you've seen so uh, i will be beginning I, i was just alluding to the to the plaque behind me uh that was for my 25th uh anniversary well that was uh, four years ago, and next so next month I'll be starting my 30th year. Congratulations, here. that's awesome. And yeah, that's I, I I'm also a professor. I teach uh, introduction to the music business at um, Monmouth University in Long Branch, New Jersey. And one of the things that I talk about with my students, I'm going into the fourth year of doing that. One of the things that I talk about is, you know, when someone gets a job, no one ever starts a job and thinks that they're going to be there for 30 years, that no. they're going to be there yeah. for, in my right. case, literally no. half of my life. I'm 60 and I have spent 30 of those years um, here, you know, at this association. So I'm certainly the exception sure. to the rule. And I have, because of that, I have really been witness to 
this evolution. I mean, when I started in 1988, heading into you know those three or four or five or six or seven or eight, nine, ten years of the halcyon days when mm -hmm. people were replacing their music collections with CDs. The CD was actually unveiled in a really unique way at a NARM convention uh, in the early 1980s. I, uh, some of the viewers or people who are going to watch this may remember this, may have been there. It preceded me by a handful of years. But what happened was, you know, we had the, the guy who, you know, invented the CD and there was this presentation on the technology behind it. And then a full orchestra uh, was on stage and playing and performing. And one by one, each of the um, musicians got up and walked off the stage. And at the moment where n everyone was gone, there was no musician on stage. The music was obviously still playing. And the guy said, so they were never playing what you were listening to <laughs> for that last, you know, how many minutes was a CD. You were listening to a CD. Um, so, I mean, that was early 80s. I came in 88. And, you know, all the benchmarks since then have been um, pretty amazing, uh, challenging, um, um, you know, death-defying uh, to, <laughs> witness, to witness because yeah. we've seen our share of you know, format changes and ups and downs in the marketplace, inventions and creations of new technology to new apps, to new complete paradigm shifts, to new business models now. And I have had uh, the great good fortune of being in this really interesting catbird seat of having a very unique vantage point from which to observe all of this, absorb the drama, absorb the change, and then put it back out, uh, you know, f as an association that serves, we have to be that mirror, that reflection. So people look in the mirror, you know, what do they see? What do they see that's around them? And they're part of this community. So we reflect that back. Uh, so our leadership, the governance, uh, our staff, you know, everything has had to evolve um, the convention, the event has had to evolve. And, you know, I've, as I said, I've been, you know, able to be uh, the quarterback of that from a CEO, president of the association's perspective, at least for the past, you know, 14 years. And then the 16 years prior to that, I was in other positions with the association. But um, I've clearly had, you know, a, a very unique career that I kind of backed into. Uh, wasn't something that I thought about. Uh, my, you know, my um, my education is as a journalist. So I worked in publishing, magazine publishing. I worked for newspaper. I did some television work, and then you know when I was in a, an interesting between jobs moment in life, I discovered uh, associations, and I worked for one in the computer industry prior to coming to NARM. Uh, so all of that uh, is the sign of the encapsulation of my 40-year career, but 30 of those 40 years have actually been here, which is crazy. Yeah. Let, yeah. let, 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 me, let me ask you, you know, one of the, obviously because of what NARM is and was, um, you go up and down with the music industry. And, you know, in the heydays of the 80s and, and, and when CDs were flush, obviously you had lots of record labels spending lots of money on everything mm -hmm. and then when the music industry basically collapses you know budgets are slashed and everything else what kind of challenge was it for NARM to weather that where all of a sudden the labels were not coming they weren't throwing the parties they weren't spending the money they weren't putting the sponsorships out there what kind of challenge was mm -hmm. that for NARM to to weather that storm mm -hmm. well the 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 i guess one of the biggest uh things in that um scenario that you just created is we became the music business association so you know we stopped being narm even though there was a lot of brand equity in that acronym uh we stopped being that because <clears throat> in order for us to remain a healthy vibrant uh reflection of the business 
we needed to be a more holistic organization. So when the name changed, uh, the identity um, that was um, created after that was of an organization that was agnostic to whatever the transaction might be, but the, are the, what was important to us was the commercial transaction. So we embraced sales, we embraced access, we embraced create, cre you know, the creative side of the business. Historically, the association was sort of a nexus of you know, commerce and content, that was the nexus. But now we've got the other piece of that triangle because it's commerce, content, and creative. Bringing the convention to Nashville um, two years ago enabled us to take that other piece of the triangle um, to another level because now we have artists and managers and um, you know publishers, musicians, consultants. A lot of the folks that are part of the Nashville music community have come into the association as members and have come to the convention as members. So there's a different dynamic now in terms of who's who's coming to the event um, you know to we say to meet and be met now we also created an academic partnership program so one of the pillars of music business association is education we've had a scholarship foundation for 50 years and given over seven million dollars uh, um, you know in awards to students to continue their education not necessarily in music, I mean, they can be studying anything, but we're giving back to people who've worked for our member companies or who are um, children or family members of our of our companies. So, at a moment in time, probably two and a half years ago, uh, at a board meeting, we talked about the fact that, you know, what role could we play in helping to prepare the next generation of music you know, business uh, leaders and visionaries and, and executives. And one of the ways that we could do that was to have a more formalized program around our relationships with the colleges and universities across the country that teach music business. So we started out with, you know, two or three, and, you know, here we are two years later, and we have almost 20 colleges and universities. Once the college or university becomes an academic partner of music biz, then any of the students who are in those programs can opt in as a member of Music Biz themselves individually. So there's you know well over 13, 1400 students plus the 20 colleges and universities. So what that translates into in terms of both the scholarship foundation and the flagship event is the, at the convention is now we have a career development track at the convention. Now we have a career day at the convention where 15 or so companies are interviewing uh, young people for internships and jobs. You know, last year, two young women from the University of Miami participated in that program and they were hired by CAA. That's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty good uh, accomplishment sure. for us in the first time we were doing we we're doing this so it's you know being replicated this year and you know who knows what will what will come out of it uh, in terms of the hirings and the business you know the opportunities that these young people can find that's great but also um, in terms of just you know the sheer numbers uh, you know for for a number of years there were sort of like people saying, you know, the the audience is aging. Well, that was true. Uh, you know, and what could we do to bring uh, some, you know, to refresh the environment, to have, you know, more young people, you know, new ideas, young ideas uh, and approaches. This has certainly also helped to do that because now there's a couple hundred music business students who are part of the fabric of the event. So the event has become kind of more of a, a, um, a patchwork or um, uh, uh, a quilt, if you will, of kind of all these different things. It was, it was one thing, it was very linear for a long time. And now, as you've said, we've, you know, blossomed and branched out. So, you know, just every aspect of the business is welcome, you know, to be part of the event. And that's part of the reason, a, bo a large part of the reason that the association has been able to remain you know, healthy and vibrant and to continue, what I say, fighting the good fight, pushing the boulder up the hill, whatever, whatever sure. phrase, phrase you want to, you know, you want to use, because this is a tough bit. It's a tough business and it's a yeah. tough business as a nonprofit, small business that we are. That's right. You know, to continue to, um, you know, be able to support the business. 
Uh, let, let me ask you a question here. So a big portion of our audience are DIY musicians, um, mm -hmm. whether they were signed in the past and now have to survive on their own or there are new young musicians coming up that basically realize, you know, the, the big record label coming in, giving you the million dollar deal is never going to be a reality again. Their career has to survive on their own efforts. Mm -hmm. right. um, what what are the benefits to these DIY artists of joining the Music Business Association? Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, I can tell you that uh, <clears throat> the fastest growing segment of the membership, of our membership, is that segment, is the individual um, creator, the individual entrepreneur, startup, uh, small label, small company, DIY, <clears throat> they're the people who are joining the association in greater numbers. Um, the opportunity to be part of the community, uh, you know, whether it just looks great, you know, on a prospectus if you're trying to go for some funding, or whether you are, um, you know, looking for some other kind of, of deal or working on um, you know, a tour or something, any aspect of what you do, there's a an inherent value attached to being part of this community, to be able to say, I am part of the Music Business Association with, you know, organizations like Apple and Amazon and Spotify and Facebook and Sony and Universal and Warner uh, and Red Eye and, you know, Big Machine, et cetera, et cetera, go, kind of go down the list. So the organization's membership is a spectrum. It's everything from, you know, an individual person who's trying to make their way in the business, maybe from the do-it-yourself um, aspect, or a student, all the way up to the senior executives of the companies that you know that I that I just mentioned. So now, when you bring 1,500 of those people together uh, at an event for four days. Um, you know, people join associations to associate. I mean, it's a very it's a very simple concept and mission. And there are myriad opportunities over those four days to meet someone, to put yourself out there, you know, to take a risk, to roll the dice, and and see what comes out of it. And yeah. to ha to be among that community, uh, f from my perspective. Uh, that's worth the price of of admission because you Absolutely. never know what that's yeah. going to lead to. I think that's really important. There's two reasons why I love this association and this meetup. The the two main things for me, and they may be a little different to other folks, but one is the panels, which I love a good spirited debate. I love intelligent people talking about streaming, downloading, physical sales, vinyl, all of these things. But the second thing, which is probably even more important, and I'd love to get your opinion on it, is one of the things that's kind of not in your on your website so much, and you just touched on it, uh, associating is the best part for me going to these events is the conversations I have in the hallway. The Hey, I see somebody. Hey, there's Terry Courier. You know, there's uh, Michael Kaufman. There's so-and-so. And you grab coffee. There's somebody from labels, distribution, artists, management, you know, the DSPs. To point, you know, to touch on what you just said, all those people are there. You can associate with them. And you do associate with them. And a lot of times that happens in an unorganized mm -hmm. fashion. Right. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the real yeah. value. Yeah. The, <clears throat> this is my third day in a row of doing these uh, uh, sorts of uh, interactive uh, interview kinds of situations. Um, so I did them, did one yesterday and the day before. And uh, the theme for those uh, was for me to kind of give a tutorial on networking. You know, how do you network? If, you've, if you're uncomfortable or unfamiliar uh, with an event and you're going for the first time, you know, what are the, the tips? What are the things sure. that you need to do um, to network? Particularly, um, you know, it was geared toward, you know, young people and students. So uh, for, first you know, tip, hang out in the bar. <laughs> <There's a lot. laughs> well, at, yeah, definitely at Music Biz. One of the things that we've done, um, because we know how important the social networking is that you just articulated is in this particular hotel on this particular property 
you know, we're on multi, we're on levels, a number yeah. of levels. So um, in this particular year that's coming up in, a, in the event in a couple of weeks, <clears throat> we have a, a networking lounge that's being sponsored by a company called Jaxta. And this is the first um, sponsor that uh, that I think we've ever had that you know decided what they wanted to sponsor, and we you know worked out the deal with them. And then they actually sent us storyboards of what they were going to create, what this lounge was going to look like. Um, so I'm not going to give that away, but I will just okay. say it's going to be a really cool branded space. Then we have Pandora. They're the sponsor of an area that already exists in the hotel called the Sip and Savor area. It's got a Starbucks. It's got one of the satellite bars. Yep. It's got a place where you can um, connect and you know do some work. And then there's a restaurant at entrance there. So that's a whole area. That's going to be a second space. And then the bar, the main bar, which is called the Bridge Bar. Uh, so that's being um, sponsored, branded uh, by Buzz Angle. So there are three sort of formal networking spaces in, in the hotel under our um, umbrella of Music Biz event where people can go. But we also have, you know, the D digital entertainment group, DEG, is um, doing a, an interactive experience uh, on high-res audio. So that's going to be a, a magnet. People are going to congregate there. Uh, there's a company called Artist Growth that's coming in with an installation where the seminars are taking place. So people will congregate there. Um, when I talked in these the two talks I did yesterday and the day before, my, my main thing, particularly to my students, is you never know who is in front of you, behind right. you, or on either side of you anywhere. So if you're in line at Starbucks at Music Biz, you know, and there's five or ten people in line, engage the person in front of you, engage the person behind you, you know, just makes sense. If people are queuing up to go into one of the big events, like the awards breakfast or the awards luncheon or, you know, Julie Greenwald and Kelly Clarkson's uh, keynote or Troy Carter's keynote, you know for a fact that there are going to be hundreds of people queued up for these events this year because we've right. scored these, you know, marquee level, um, you know, speakers. So that's going to be another opportunity to just, you know, chat, chat with someone um, in an event, in a seminar, you know, when it concludes and people are queuing up at the head table to ask a speaker a question or to exchange a business card. You know, you can turn to the person next to you who's waiting also and say, what did you think? You know, you know, you you chose this session. Why did you decide to come to this, and what did you learn from it? What did you get out of it? There's just so many ways to open it. You know, to kind of open a window or Absolutely. open a door. Let, let, and, let me ask you yeah. a specific, and and Jay, you can chime in on this as well because I've got my feelings. But in relation, you're 100 percent right, and you know, you need to engage with people. But is there an appropriate engagement and an inappropriate engagement? Meaning. You're an artist. This is the first time you've been here. Is it appropriate to just turn around and say, here's my CD? Will you listen uh, to this? Uh, people will do that. Uh, people have done that to me um, or for me or with me. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very gregarious and open to pretty much anyone and anything uh, at the convention. I, you know, People come up to me and joke and, and say, you know, it, it, it's almost like it's your you know, kids bar mitzvah or, you know, your daughter's wedding or something like that, because I feel yeah. like everybody are my guests at this event. So I'm very open to that experience of people handing me a CD. You're right, though, not everybody will be. And uh, you've got to obviously be someone who picks up on on social cues. Clearly, you, you would not want you would not pr propose to do that and walk over to someone like say you see Scott Borchetta you know, in the hallway and he's talking to someone. Uh, you would not walk over and interrupt that conversation and say, uh, excuse me for a minute, I just, I, you know, I really like you and I like your label and here's my CD. That would not be the appropriate time. So you gotta have a sense of you know, your surroundings, you watch people. If he's engaged in a conversation, he finishes that conversation and then starts to walk away from that conversation, he's by himself, that's an appropriate opportunity to walk up and, and extend your hand, um, shake someone's hand and introduce yourself. The exchange of the music 
whether it's a CD or a jump drive, or uh, I've had people hand me press kits, you know, a folder with stuff in it. Um, you know, that isn't always that opportunity. The opportunity is there to have a brief conversation, maybe exchange a card, if you will, and be able to say as you're exiting that uh, experience, um, can I send you some of my music? Um, you know, would it be appropriate for me to follow up with you and reach out to you in a few weeks? Or is there someone else, you know, on your staff that would be more appropriate for me to follow up with? You know, those those kinds of things. Most of our people, and I think, you know, Jay, and you, I think you both would agree with this, is um, particularly when we're talking about a senior person and a young person, which, you know, are going to be a lot of these interactions. They really do... Um, I think they're good about that. I think yeah. they're very good about that situation. Uh, interestingly, when it's more um, contemporaries potentially coming to each other, that might be a more uh, you know formal kind of exchange where someone would say, "Well, aren't we meeting tomorrow? You know, let's talk about that then." Uh, I almost think there's a little more of a deference to the startup or the developer or the student. Um, that is wide-eyed and excited to be there and has the opportunity, you know, to, as I said, to, you know, walk up to a Scott Bruschetta or walk up to a Mike Dungan or walk up to a sure. John Esposito, um, you know, at the event and, you know, and have that opportunity. You know, yeah, I, I, I think I, you're I, absolutely right. I think, sorry, Mike, I, I think just to add to that, I, I've seen a, a lot of this over the years and everybody has been so receptive and so cool and the best part and the advice i would give people is make sure you've got a pocket full of business cards number one because you're going to meet a lot of different people and number two i've seen some people get a little bit more creative like this uh, one woman i thought it was brilliant she took these like five dollar starbucks cards and had her name and stuff printed on there and then Great. people kind of remembered her Great I remember idea. last year i got a really nice postcard from this guy and we you know you follow up with all these different people afterwards and this helps you kind of remember it and then the last thing is I remember this one gentleman we had a really nice conversation in line and he said hey you know I'd, I'd love to get your advice on a couple of things would you mind if I called you I said no problem and he gave me this really cool like sticker this really cool like little decal just mm -hmm. little things to kind of you know, so people kind of remember who you are. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's you, you're, you want to stand out among, you know, hun literally hundreds and hundreds, you know, of people. The other advice that I give, particularly as it relates to um, speakers who are at the event. So if you are preparing your schedule and you're selecting the, you know, out of the hundred plus sessions that we have, which is crazy, but, um, and we've got over 200 speakers. So you're doing your homework. You're, you're deciding what things you're gonna go to. And if you're going with an idea in your head of a particular company that's there or a particular person that's there, let's say it's a, a, an artist manager. Well, certainly you wanna do some research on that manager you know, prior to going to the event and identify, okay, who, what, who are the artists that this person manages? So that if you are fortunate enough to get you know, a few minutes with that person, you're able to, you know, ask a question or make a comment about one of their artists. If it's a company yeah. that has created or is doing something new, a new service, a new product, a new deal that they just signed, yep. be familiar with that. Always be armed, I, I tell people, always be armed with a couple of questions that you want to ask that person. You want to you want to show that you're engaged. Uh, you want to make that the, the person that you're trying to meet, make them the focus of this exchange. So show that you have an interest in them and you've done some homework about their company or their business or, or what they're doing. That's good. That will that opens a door for you um, that probably could close quickly if you're all about what that person's going to do for you. Yeah, I agree with that so much, James. Uh, two quick things. One is I found that in a, at a high level, nobody wants to give you a job, but everybody wants to give you advice. And I haven't met anyone who I've gone to from Doug Morris, Jim Urie, anybody. You go to somebody who you respect and admire and say, hey, I'd really like your advice on something. I think nine times out of ten, if you're kind about it, you're going to get something for it. Yeah. But secondarily to that, how do you join Music Business Association? For our viewers, 
how would somebody go about being a part of this organization? Uh, so our website is musicbiz.org. Uh, if you go to the website, um, just purely from the standpoint of um, logistics and mechanics, so you can join online, you can go to the website. We have a, you know, a cadre of, uh, of categories of you know, where you see where you fit in. Um, are there different? Are there different membership fees based on your different? Yeah, there. <clears throat> yeah, there are different membership fees. You know, if you're an unfunded startup, if you're a student, if you're part of an academic uh, partnership institution, if you're a small label or retailer or whatever. And then there, you know, as you go up the chain, uh, the the fees are obviously scaled by the size sure. of the and but the revenue are, are of, the, the, of the, the company. Are the benefits the same for benefits everybody? are the same? Okay. Yeah. So if, if you join as a, a student, um, you're getting access to the same website, the same data, the same information, the same lists of, of members that somebody who works for Facebook or Spotify or Universal or Sony gets. I mean, we're there's parity when it comes to what we to what we do. Fair enough. Um, but what's uh, I think what's important and what's different and what's changing is that the membership is now so eclectic that there are entities who join in sort of our other categories, like other suppliers or related um, categories that have a business that interacts with or um, partners with the music business. So now there are accounting firms. Um, we had a, a company join, some, one of my staff just told me today, that's a cigar company. And, you know, they obviously there's an opportunity for them to come to Nashville and come to the event. Uh, and maybe they're looking to meet managers and maybe find an artist that could be a, a spokesperson. Particular you know, for lifestyle them. labels. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, last year we started a brand summit. Um, we're doing it for the second year. And, you know, there's Cracker Barrel and there's Chevrolet. Um, you know, there are, you know, a variety of companies that are going to be part of that. One thing about that that's exciting is, so in the, that morning, we're honoring Mike Dungan with the Presidential Award, and Little Big Town is going to perform as part of the tribute to him. Uh, but Karen Fairchild, who's part of Little Big Town, has just uh, closed a deal with Macy's for a clothing line called Fair Child. And um, she's going to be up there performing, and an hour later, she's going to be, you know, sitting on the dais at the brand summit with uh, someone from her management and someone from um, um, a label talking about um, her deal with Macy's. So, you know, nice. that's you know, you look at the event and you think about, um, you know, it's a lot of it is about relationships. Sure. You know, the music business is is built on it's relationships. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, listen. You know what? This has been a fascinating conversation. I I encourage everybody to go to this convention. I'll be there. Feel free to reach out to me for. We'll hook up for a cup of coffee. But how can they uh, find more about James online? Yeah, you can you know find out more about me at at musicbiz.org. Uh, as I said, I'm, um, I've been doing this job for a long time. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have um, been able to um, take this experience of these 30 years and this career yeah. um, to do something that I've always thought about doing, always wanted to do, didn't know if I would ever have the opportunity to do, and that's to teach. That's great. Um, you know, I was... Um, you know, fortunate to run into an, an old friend, Joe Rapola, um, who had worked for Warner and then worked for sure, Universal. Sure. sure. And we ran into each other at a conference where we were on panels that were following each other, and we had a, a couple minutes to chat. And I hadn't seen him in a handful of years, so I said, "You know, what are you doing now?" He said, "You're not going to believe this, but I'm the, the the chair of the Department of Music and Theater at Monmouth University in Long Branch, New Jersey." And I said, you know, you know, I've always thought about, you know, what I getting an opportunity to teach something I've always thought about doing. Awesome. But I wondered, you know, uh, what would be the right opportunity and would I like it and would I be good at it? So we had that initial chat and he said, if you ever decide for sure that you want to do this, in addition to your 60 hour a week job, <laughs> yeah. um, let me know. So we went back and forth for like six months, and I hemmed and hawed, and I wasn't sure. Finally, 
you know, I just said, okay, I'm going to do it. And now I'm going into my fourth year of, uh, uh, of teaching so this cool. class. And it's, it's, I was at a point in my life where I thought, you know, in my late 50s, is there, you know, can I reinvent myself? Is there something new I can learn? Is there some something else out there that's going to change things up for me? And this absolutely was it because meeting these young people and mentoring them and helping them find what might be the right path for them in the business um, has been an enormous amount of work. I will that's not awesome. lie. It's a lot of work. Sure. But it's, I have left this experience, or I'm in this experience, um, getting so much more out of it than I'm putting into it. And I know I'm there to inspire them, but they are absolutely inspiring me. And I think it's made me a better executive for having had and having this experience of, of doing this teaching. Because now a lot of these students are coming to the convention. Yeah. and. You know, it's it's just it's just been a, a great experience. Well, thank you for that um, on behalf of uh, all of these folks, and thank you so much for being a part of our podcast. And we'll look forward to seeing you in Nashville in a couple weeks. Um, great, great talk with James. Um, yeah, good conversation. Good, good conversation. You know, it's 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 been interesting to watch the evolution of NARM into the Music Business Association. Yeah. Yeah, it has. And, and they've and it, embraced it. You know, I, I went had to the panel. They had to. Yeah. Last year was really good, but this year is going to be even better. You know, there's days of panels with, you know, people you know, like Pandora and Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon, Amazon MP3. And there's a lot of things going on. And I think that whether you're a DIY artist, musician, whether you're a manager, whether you're signed, whether you're not, I think there's something you can find and learn and benefit from. But more importantly, what I touched on about those hallway conversations you know, just waiting in line at Starbucks or seeing somebody that you've seen in trade publications, everybody is so cool. You can go up, exchange business cards, and have a dialogue. I think it's really worth going. You know, and, and I would just add, that's in general for any event you go to. That's a good point, sure. Um, but I think it's also important to point out, everybody's going to be polite to you when you meet them. And, and, and what I mean by that is, Nobody wants to cause a scene and nobody wants to be a dick in the middle of a conversation. But that doesn't mean it's okay to shove CDs in people's faces. You know, yeah. I think you, you could probably attest to this. I've been at many events where people just walk up and, hi, blah, 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 I've read you, I've heard you, whatever. Would you take, take my CD and give it a listen? I'm not going to be a dick and say no. But I also don't want to walk around an event for the next six hours carrying a stack of CDs with me. Yeah. Remember that. I don't want to do that. So I, I would much rather, and I think most people would much rather have uh, a SoundCloud a, a, a refreshing or... conversation to remember who you are, exchange contact information, and then follow up and send them a link or something like that. Or, sure. or yeah, at least on the back of your business card, put a link to SoundCloud or, yeah, or something that's, for a free that's a good download. Idea. But keep in mind, you know, we don't want to walk around carrying press kits. We don't no, want to walk James around touched with, on that, right. with a Somebody stack gave him a of press CDs. Kit. Sure. You know, and, and yeah. again, we're not going to – here's the thing. This is this – is I've seen this happen, and, and it's a bit sad. You're not going to be a dick again and say, no, I don't want your press kit. But a half hour later when that person leaves the bar, I bet that press kit's sitting on the bar. I bet it's sitting on the floor next to a chair or something like that. So, you know, just be considerate of that. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think that those who go to this event are going to find people are very welcoming, very warm. And to your point, don't give them a chore, you know, don't give yeah. them an errand to run, you know, think about them for a moment. But some of those things we mentioned, like postcards, business cards, stickers, things like that, there's all sorts of protected SoundCloud links or private YouTube videos. There's all sorts of ways you can share music with people where they don't have to carry things around. And to be frank, a lot of these folks may not even have a CD player handy. Well, well, please, I mean, listen, I don't have a CD player at home in my office. It's not built into my laptop anymore. I've got the $99, you know, add-on super drive for my, for my Mac. So if I want to listen to a CD, I got to make sure I've got that with me. 
Right. So again, you got to get with the times, but be considerate of people. Yeah. And check out the Music Business Association and check out our sponsor. Hypebot. 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 So let's let's do uh, another episode of you need help with your online strategy. Yeah, and let's uh, you go this time. Th- this week I've got one. Okay, if you make a major announcement on a Sunday, which also happens to be a major holiday, you need help with your online strategy. And, and why what, is that? And why is that? Because a couple things here. You're probably making a major announcement, hoping to get some press get some attention well first of all nothing's happening on a Sunday you know nobody media is not in the office on a Sunday waiting for your announcement of a tour of a new CD of a new video Um, that's just not happening and add to that if it's a holiday please nobody's going to be around for the holiday that's right so so you need you know you need to keep this in mind um Good publicists know this. They know, you know what, if I want to release something and get it buried, if I want to make a statement but I want it buried because I don't want anybody to pick up this statement, I'm going to release it at 5 p.m. on a Friday Right. because everybody's gone. No one's going to see it on Saturday. Nobody's going to see it on Sunday. By the time they come into their office on Monday, their inbox has got 200 more emails on top of our statement. Right. You've buried it. In but, politics, they call that take out the trash day. Yes, but that, what that also means is if your statement was actually something really important, it also got buried. That's right. Yeah, and I would encourage people to look at your Facebook insights and see what days people are engaging most in your your posts. And maybe you you might find that it's midweek <laughs> around lunchtime, you know, Um it, it's probably not on the weekends. You want to maximize yes. your audience as much as you can. You know, do you, you you might consider you send it out first thing Monday morning, so it's the first thing in the top of their inbox on a Monday when they're back in the office. But you got to consider these sorts of things of of when you want to catch somebody's attention, when you don't want to catch somebody's attention. And and I think very few people are doing something where they don't want somebody to pay attention. That's usually yeah. you're usually Fair dealing, enough. you're usually trying to clean up a mess. <clears throat> if if that's what you're doing, most people are like announcing a new video, announcing a new album, announcing a sure. tour. Yeah, you want people to pay attention, so think about when that announcement is Good being one. made. Don't yeah. make it on the Fourth of July. No, because no one will read it. <laughs> even even if your album is called the Fourth of July, don't yeah, make don't it on the Fourth of July. <laughs> no, fair enough. Good one. All right, there you go. Another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. We're out of here till next week. Thanks, everyone.